as I laid there on the ground, I was completely aware of everything going on. I knew my leg was damaged. I watched my buddy remove my foot separately from the vehicle. There's nothing I can do about it. I have to lay here and relax, just suck it up. It's uh, 6, 10 in the evening. It's over 140 degrees probably. You got all this gear on, the vehicle's vibrating, you're miserable, you, you know, you're, um, your senses are completely sharp because you're in a hostile area. I was approached by friends of Daniel Gilliatt to uh, basically pick up his motorcycle and bring it to the shop and get it running for him as a special gift. You know, what he had done for, the, for us, you know, as a, as a Marine and went over to Iraq on a, two tours. There's a few people that are involved in it that are pretty excited and want to be a part of it just to kind of show our appreciation to them. It's tough to listen to some of the stories, just to listen to some of the stories. So to imagine what he had to go through over there is unfathomable for a guy like me who's never been in that situation. We were out patrolling an area. We were going out looking for landmines and, and bombs. And we'd found our very large roadside bomb and went and secured the area. And once we had gotten up on top of this one mountain top, we detonated the roadside bomb. And as we rolled forward, we, end, we ended up finding one that was buried in the ground, but we found it the hard way. Next thing you know, your ears are ringing, the vehicle's, you know, dead silent. There's dust and dirt floating around the inside of the vehicle, and it dawns on you that, you know, you've just been blown up, or you've just been hit with a really, really big bomb. You're, you know, your ears are still ringing. And um, so my first instinct was to holler at everybody to get out of the vehicle. But I fell out on the ground and tried pulling myself loose from the vehicle and pushing myself away. And I couldn't because my right leg was stuck. I had a piece of copper line from the heater core stuck in my leg. My buddy jumped down from the top of our vehicle and got a tourniquet on me. And I watched him remove my foot from the truck. And I knew that I had to remain calm because we were a long ways away from anywhere. We were way out in the middle of the desert. We went over to the house, captured the motorcycle, put it on a trailer, and got out of there without being seen. When I actually realized what I had done, I had not only heisted a guy's motorcycle, but it was really wasn't worth heisting anyway. And it's not a pretty motorcycle. I mean, even knew it wasn't pretty. You have a, a mole that's been underground, and you want to make Cinderella out of it. And this is not going to work in this garage. And you know, we had so many different concerns. We had to make a, we had to make a shifter, number one, because he is an amputee. Uh, we had to have a place for his foot to be. We had to make the bike stable. We had to make the bike uh, presentable. And, and another thing, we had to make it run. Uh, anybody that knows Harleys and knows Ironhead Sportsters kind of knows that once you start fixing something on them and as hard as they've been rode and put away and mishandled, it's, you know, one thing leads to another. It was clear that people had, many people had had their hands in it before we got to it, so. <laughs> As I looked around, my buddies were kind of long-faced and freaking out like deer in headlights. So I started making jokes about it. And uh, the, uh, the, the medic that was working on me, by the time he got up there, he was securing my tourniquet more. And then I asked him if I could get another shot of morphine. And uh, he had been bumping my leg the whole time because he was extremely nervous, which, you know, hurt like you wouldn't believe. But at one point, I asked him for the shot of morphine and he goes, okay, and he sticks his elbow in my freshly amputated leg. He sticks his elbow in my leg as he leans across and jabs me with this shot of morphine. And I said, Doc, I said, the next time you bump my leg, I'm going to punch you right between the legs. And so all my guys started laughing. And then I looked over at my buddy, the one who got the tourniquet on me. I said, you know, speaking of that, you know, do I still have all my stuff? And my buddy was like, oh, you're going to have to check that yourself. And I'm like, I already did. I'm good. And again, everybody started laughing. So it was like, you know, I knew that laughter was kind of bringing them back to reality and it was snapping them out of it. And I looked over at my captain, I said, sir, I don't think I'm gonna make the gym tonight. And very proud of Daniel's service uh, over in Iraq. 
and the sacrifices that he made to help secure our freedoms. You know, we decided to get together and, and uh, uh, do this thing up for him really nice. Looked it over and seeing how close it was to stock and the condition it was, it pretty much took off from there. And we got to looking at it and wanted it to, wanted it to really be unique and we really couldn't do that and leave the frame the way it was. So we got a little bit more into it than we thought we were going to and uh, ended up cutting the whole frame in half and losing the back half of it. The motor had to stay in there until the last minute for him to get everything lined up. Me, Billy, you just cut off all the shit you told me to say. Been a couple days in uh, Baghdad and uh, still very worried about being killed over there because you could still hear rockets and mortars coming in so I was still uneasy and uh, wouldn't allow myself to relax. Made it to the hospital and once I got to the hospital I looked around to a lot of guys who had gotten a second chance at life and they weren't taking it so well. Some of them weren't. They were sitting around feeling sorry for themselves or just kind of uh, complaining a lot and not putting forth a whole lot of effort. And uh, so I seen that as an opportunity to um, do one of two things, either completely, you know, let that slip away and do something horrible with it or, you know, fight and become the warrior that I'd learned to become and uh, see it as another obstacle. So within 27 days of me losing my leg, I was actually walking. And within the first week, I'd, I'd thrown the cr canes and the crutches down and was walking without either one and uh, wouldn't allow the doctors to help me. I just told them if I fell down, you know, I'll, I'll get back up. Just leave me alone. Let me walk. Underneath the tank, along the backbone's one splice, and down here is where we cut away the rest of it and pretty well threw away the back half of the frame and started from scratch. I sliced everything off of here, which you can still see some of this that's there, which will be gone when the bike is finished. And John went ahead and fabricated the piping to reconfigure the whole back of the bike. Wanted to lower the bike, give it that old school bobber look. Uh, used a stock rear fender on it, cut down, and bent all the tubing by hand. And we come up, he come up with uh, the custom mounts for the big twin full covered shocks on here, which are a shorter shock than what stock is on the big twins. And actually lowered the whole bike down probably about an inch and a half to two inches. We ended the tube frame back here where we could use these bullet style tail lights into the back end of it. All these are holding up old, old style tins that we found and modified to fit this bike. Danny had started fabrication on it a little bit and kind of went the old school type of way. So we decided to keep going that direction. Couldn't find an oil tank that would fit in here. So we just decided to make another one of those. Ended up having to fab an oil tank and fab the gussets for the frame to mount it. That'll locate the battery there and still give us the opportunity to use this in this frame setup. To accommodate Danny's leg, he, hasn't, he was not able to shift or use a clutch with his uh, left foot, so we designed this shifter to run all of his linkages. Uh, we got a little tip off from one of his friends that he'd always wanted a grenade shifter with the clutch on it, so, uh, so we got us a couple grenades and made it work. We, uh, it'll clutch out here and everything will shift in just fine. In my teenage years, it was a lot easier to quit and run the other direction because there was no discipline or structure. Growing up, my father wasn't around a whole lot. I was a long-haired kid uh, doing a lot of stupid stuff that I shouldn't be doing, and I had absolutely no future. I felt that I needed to completely get away from Kansas City and get my life squared away. So they had two different things uh, going on up in Montana, and one was an all-Indian job corps, and I, being an artist, I wanted to get close to nature, see the mountains, you know, maybe draw eagles and bears and this and that, and uh, just completely clear my mind out and focus on getting my education. And so I struggled for a while trying to get a job. So my next step to me was to join the military, something I always wanted to do. And it wasn't just the military, it was the Marine Corps. It was, if I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna give it 100% and I want the hardest and the most challenge I can possibly get. It just it totally made sense that that was the next step in my life and that was the next big hurdle I needed to jump over. The first call was in 2003 and I went to Iraq 
We spent uh, most of our time in Kuwait, but we were able to do a lot of missions into Iraq. We were doing a lot of convoys and stuff uh, to support the mission. When we had off time, I uh, ran a professional tattoo parlor. I, and I believe that is the first in military history period that it was authorized by you know, the higher ups to legally do the tattooing. I had an old 52K model tank that uh, with minor modifications made fit this uh, later model, Sportster, compared to the 52, and come up with uh, an outside fuel gauge for it, which is basically going to be off these two fittings right here. Uh, with the clear tube coming up, he'll look down, he can see exactly where he's at as far as fuel goes. Pulled the covers, cylinders, sent them out to the powder coat, the heads out to powder coat. Then we cleaned up the lower end of it took the cams out, checked them over, made sure they was all within spec, wanted reliability more than anything. Now that the majority of the fabrication works together and we've all gotten, gotten it all put back together, we're gonna go ahead and tear it down now. What we're doing is a, a three-stage process uh, where the primary base color will be silver and then what we're going to do is uh, uh, put a few coats of a custom blue candy blend over top of the silver um, and then proceed with the airbrush artwork and then once that's finished we'll clear coat and, and polish all of the parts uh, ready for delivery. Fenders. One of them's got a face nice. right there. Very nice. We uh, got the motorcycle, all the powder coating, all the paint, all the parts and pieces were, were hit at the same day. Uh, they were all delivered to bears. And the parts are wonderful. The paint looks great. The seat looks great. This is going to work out. But it's not together yet. And then in 2005, I was called again, and so I answered the call with the 24th Marines, who are the guys that I'd served with for the last almost eight years, and back to Iraq we went. Just say your freaking last name. I'm Navarro. Ferdina. It's Ferdina. <laughs> Brian. Mac. Primo. G. Ludwig. Pokies. <laughs> yeah, it's like freaking your head's taking up the entire screen. <laughs> and this time we were in a completely different situation where we were actually in uh, a very hostile area. In fact, it was the hottest area in the country. There's a lot of rockets and mortars and bombs and so on, you know, every single day. I got to know a lot of the different brothers, you know, and, and uh, their, their closeness to one another. And then when somebody got killed, I was honored to have the opportunity to be able to have them come back and say, you know, hey, such and such got killed today. I need a, a memorial tattoo. And we'd sit down and figure out something. They could get the tattoo right there. So not only were they getting a tattoo in a hostile area, in a, in a country where you would never figure somebody would be getting a tattoo in, but they were also getting a memorial tattoo on the very day that you know somebody was killed. And there was also a memorial wall for every time somebody got killed, they came in and wrote their name down on that wall. So it was always in remembrance of you know our fallen brothers. I was the vehicle commander, so I was in the right front seat. It blew the whole complete front end of my truck off. It uh, ripped my leg off with it in the, in the process. And the leg was blown off just below the knee, but uh, through the, all the amputations and stuff to cle keep the soil and the infection out, it ended up being above the knee. Got the bike on the, on the lift and started the assembly process. John, Barry, Travis, and Jesse are working diligently to get this thing back together. They had worked, you know, hours and hours to get this done. It was Thursday evening about 9.30, uh, right before the Saturday reveal and I got a phone call and all I heard was a, a motorcycle running and it was Money Shot called me from Bears to let me know it runs. 
I'm going to be going to help me in the presentation of this board, Sergeant Dan Gilliam. As I'm going through my rehab and I'm learning how to walk and everything else, I find out that my buddy's coming home and we're going to present him with his Purple Heart for being wounded in combat and that he was going to get his Navy Achievement Medal with a Combat V for saving my life. Corporal Birnbaum's initiative, courage, and devotion to duty reflected great credit upon himself and upheld the highest traditions of the Marine Corps and the United States Naval Service. I was asked a couple of days in advance if I would come up and honor him by pinning his medals upon his chest. Being that I was doing as good as I was doing, I came home, I put on my uniform like nothing had ever happened, I put on my boots and everything else, and on the day that he got his medals, I marched in and pinned them on his chest, and he had no idea I was coming. So it was a very emotional day that day. He was completely blown away by it and told him, you know, thank you for saving my life because of you. I get to spend every day with my kids now. You know, Danny walks in, I looked over at him and I said, you need to come here. And his reaction to me, what am I doing here? What's going on? For all the years, all the things you do, to keep us safe. Go ahead, guys. Well, what do you think? Get That's on awesome. It. Get on it. Yeah. Do you realize that was your bike? <laughs> and what we ended up doing was making a functional motorcycle for him, custom made, that he can ride from here to the end of the earth. It went from a $1,000 piece of crap to a $20,000 piece of artwork to see what they did with this bike and to see the heart and soul that went into this. It's truly an amazing bike and to see all the creativity that went into this bike. For anybody who has served, we, we do what we do because America is worth it, just like you know, the men and women before us who have uh, died on the battlefield. We do this you know, because we want to. Um, we don't do it for recognition. You know, we just believe that everybody in America is worth it. Here's another avenue, and here's a positive way. This is how we're going to overcome it and I'm going to set the example. There's guys worse off than me. I have no reason to complain or argue about what I have or, or don't have. And this is my opportunity to set an example to help the other guys out. What's similar to what you've been, what, the, what most of the guys have been through in, in combat or in training, even if they haven't ever been up here on the snow? Focus. Focus, focus, focus. Uh, be confident. Uh, have no fear. Well, it's one thing for somebody with two good arms and two good legs to say, you can do this, and then it's, somebody, it's something else that somebody who's been there and done that say, hey, you can do this, and actually set the example and show them the way. Me having a, a fresh new start at life and a whole new opportunity to not sweat the little things and be able to do all the things that I want to do without any hesitation of any type of fear or regret. And I keep getting flooded with all these different letters of inspiration. I've inspired somebody by my story or by the obstacles that I've overcome. Instead of doing something horrible, I've set an example for a lot of people to live by. You know, whether it's them wanting a hero or just, you know, needing inspiration, whatever it takes, you know, so be it. You know, uh, I was able to uh, get that bike out there and, and find out what it can do. You know, here's us with the wind in our hair having a good time out and just screwing around and having a good time and uh, going down the highway just, you know, enjoying the life. Life is a gift. Enjoy it to the fullest. And that's what we were doing. We were out there just having a good time. And, uh, and to be able to ride beside Bear, to be able to ride with my brother and my buddies, you know, that was, to get back out there on the road, that was, uh, you know, I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world. To me, there's uh, no greater feeling of freedom. I mean, it's, it's like, to me, it's like being an eagle and getting out there and getting the wind under your wings and just soaring. 
there's nothing between you and the ground but the wind. You're not promised tomorrow. Live every day to the fullest.